Hello, everyone. We are back here again, uh, one more live. Tonight, we have a very special guest, Gary Lindsay. Gary was my main teacher in the United States while I was doing my master's, master's at Miami University, uh, University of Miami. And it will be very nice. He's going to talk about arranging techniques for winds and for horns and big band. Um, I'm doing two lives a week. It's every Mondays uh, and Tuesdays. No, every Mondays and Thursdays at 8 p.m. Brazil time. Most of them are in Portuguese. Uh, uh, some of them are in English, but I'm trying to find. I'm going to find a, a way to add subtitles uh, to both languages. Okay, Ajanur, good to see you here. So today I'm very happy to announce that Gary is our guest because I, I. Gary is very important, a very important person, very important teacher in my life, and I'm sure he can contribute and share very good things uh, with you guys. Okay, so feel free to ask questions, to make any comments, or even if you need some translation, I'm not going to do uh, translation all the time, but if needed, I can translate a few points. Okay, so let's call Gary here. Hey, Gary. Hi, Douglas. How are you? Good. How are you? Thank you very much. I'm good. Thank you very much for uh, accepting my invitation to talk to my followers here and uh, teach them a little bit. So I had this cloud over my head for some reason. I'm not sure what that is, but it might be the light. Yeah. Uh, let me let me turn that light off. Okay. I can't see who is in the live now, who is participating, who's watching. So if you want to say hi, uh, feel free to say hi, okay? I know I can hear the Lorenzi is there. Is that worse? Yeah, no, no, it's good. That's good? It's good. Okay. Yeah, it's good. Okay. Okay, Gary. Uh, so as I was saying, thank you very much. And how would you like to start? Maybe you would like to tell a little bit about the Studio Just Writing program? Sure, yeah. I came to the university in 1978 as a student to get a master's degree. And my intention was to get a master's degree in writing, but they didn't have that program. So I got a master's degree in jazz performance instead. Mm -hmm. um, and after taking classes, and I was lucky enough to teach arranging while I was a grad assistant. And then in uh, 1980, I started the program. So I started my own writing program uh, that would develop for a number of years, it's still going on now. I taught the program Studio Jazz Writing and Jazz Composition. Studio Jazz Writing being a master's program and Jazz Composition being a, a doctoral program. Uh, and taught it uh, up until just two years ago when I retired. And Steve Guerra now is continuing on with the program. So it's still going really strong. It's a unique program and it uh, gradually developed and evolved uh, through the years and as technology became uh, easier to use and cheaper, we were able to incorporate. So my intention was always to prepare jazz writers and arrangers and orchestrators for the real world in terms of getting a job and being able to uh, be uh, employable you know, in, the, mm -hmm. in that profession. So with my connections in the industry and then with students that would go into the industry, I gradually made some changes in the program to make it so that as the industry changed, I changed my program to reflect that so that the students would get as much as possible out of it. So as things progressed, I added, besides all the writing that my students do, the students at that point, about uh, 19, I think it was 86 or so, when we were able to incorporate having my students use a studio, recording studio. And that grew to the point where we had a studio at our disposal and the equipment kept improving. I was able to get some grants to help improve the studio itself. The students now, besides doing all the writing, orchestrating, arranging for instrumental groups, orchestra, jazz bands, small bands, vocal groups, besides doing all that, they were also recording and mixing themselves. So they were learning the the art of using Pro Tools and mixing. And then we expanded it again, probably a few years, four years after that, 
when we start incorporating video. And with that, the students learn a little bit more about the language of video so that they could talk to directors and talk to other filmmakers and be a little bit uh, more informed about that part of the industry. Uh, and then, uh, so then it turned out that now my students were not only arranging the music, rehearsing the music, recording the music, mixing the music, and also doing video on top of that and incorporating the video and the audio together. Yeah, so Gary, I have to say that uh, while when I was uh, looking for schools to study in the United States, uh, I, I did a research, and because University of Miami had like some studios and they had a recording program together with writing, not just r traditional writing, that made my decision, you know, right. uh, like to learn recording things. Right, and it kept developing, so we had our own studio. So students had a lot of time in the studio, had a lot of chance to do their own projects. It just kept expanding from there. But the, the uh, core of the program has always been the writing part of it. Right. And this kind of this added thing that made it possible for students to make hopefully great demos. On top of that, what really made my program unique is we had great musicians. So uh, the music is great, but unless you get to hear it. So with yeah. the fantastic musicians in the studio, uh, jazz program, we were able to record all kinds of things, as you know, record full orchestra, record uh, jazz bands, small groups, uh, vocal ensembles, so all of that and enhance the program. So it, it was uh, a great place to be in the middle of that, to have the best performers and then have the equipment and have students that were really enthusiastic about writing. So kind yeah, of really and nice. the students would leave the school with a portfolio because right. they recorded everything. Right. And this is, very, this is very, very important to get into the, into the business. Right. And although it's great to have the degree, and that means something too, right. what really means something in the industry of writing is let me hear what you have, yeah. hear what you do, you know, or see in the, with the videos. So that, uh, that enhanced it. And as you know, well, you're, you're one of the prime examples. You're in the middle of the industry. You're doing all kinds of things for orchestra and commercials and all kinds of recording and producing. So you're a good example of what um, can happen. But, and what, what made me get in, in the business was my portfolio. When I came to Brazil and I, I showed my, my orchestrations and the recordings and the film scoring things. So, so definitely, definitely this is a, a special point about University of Miami, the recording part. Mm -hmm. Definitely help. Every, is everyone uh, uh, hearing us well? Can you hear me well? Can you hear Gary well? Is ever, can you just say, please say if you're hearing us well. There's a delay. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, Gary. So, <clears throat> what did you prepare to show us tonight? Well, the first thing I'd like to show you, this is a a demo I did just really for my own fun. Um, it, it's a funk chart where I did all the rhythm section in the box, in the computer itself, uh, except for the guitar. I, one of my former students, uh, Andrew Sinewick, a great LA guitar player, was gracious enough to record guitar part over the tracks. And then uh, some of my other friends, former students and other friends uh, played the horn. Very nice, Gary. Thank you. Very nice. So you see Andrew Sinewick guitars. Uh, these are other gentlemen, Major Bailey's trombone player. Andrew was in my class. Yes, right. He's, he's very busy in LA at, uh, nowadays. He, he is, yeah. Let me put that back up again. Oh, uh, uh, let's see. Uh, voice, uh, your voice is a little low, Gary, if you can turn it up. Okay. They're saying here. Check, okay. check, check. Hopefully that'll be good. Yeah. The graphic is a little better now, isn't Gary? Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, are you see, you're not seeing it now though. Oh, there it is. Okay. Can I get that back in the middle of the screen? Sure. Opa, wait. Uh, just stream. I need to share Let's that again. To the okay, beginning. Yeah. okay. Yeah. Good. So I'm going to start and stop it. Um, 
You'll notice that the, this, um, the only thing on the score is the horn parts because that's really what this was about. And most of the other things I just uh, worked from a lead sheet and improvised the bass parts and the keyboard parts and all that using software inside the computer. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll talk, I won't really talk about the rhythm section. If someone has a specific question, but otherwise I'll talk about the horns. Okay. And um, in doing this, I wanted to demonstrate not only a lots of ways of voicing the horns, but also the textures that you can get with a trumpet, a trombone, alto, tenor, and barry. And there's lots of textures. Um, there's all kinds of unison possibilities. If you just write for the alto and the trumpet, that's a, a particular sound. The trumpet and the tenor is a particular sound. The trombone and the tenor. You know, all, all the different combinations um, give you different textures. And then you start adding a third horn, trumpet, alto, and tenor. That's a texture. Trumpet, trombone, and barry. You know, so I wanted to demonstrate different kinds of textures. You see right off the bat, the first thing you hear is the alto, uh, the alto tenor, and, and trombone. So that's the very first texture. And they're playing in exact unison which is another part of the texture. Are they unison or are they octaves? So here it's unison, and you get a particular sound from that. I'll play it from here, I think. Back it up a little bit. There it comes. Okay, and also the dynamic that you write will have an effect on it. So since that's pretty soft, you get a pretty mellow sound out of the trombone and, uh, and tenor and alto. It's not that aggressive because of the dynamic. As it gets a little bit higher and I bring the dynamic up a little bit, it gets a little bit more aggressive, and then I add the trumpet, as you can see in the second measure, as part of this rundown, and I do a, a thing that, where it's two lines overlapping. So I get a kind of a falling cadence between the two. Did um, you play something on your piano? Yes. Uh, I, I didn't hear. We didn't hear anything. Um, let me, uh, you can't hear this? No. No? Okay. Oh, can you guys, can, can, can you guys hear the piano? No, can't hear the piano? No. All right, let me, let me use this other piano. Oh. Yeah, I can hear now. Okay. I can hear now. Okay. So the line comes goes between the two. Then it continues. Let me just play this. Okay, and that's the first section where now I get into some harmony. And um, there's the textures possible... Again, it depends on how many notes you're writing. Here I'm writing pretty aggressive, and so part of it is five different pitches. And then that second part of the phrase, there's only four pitches because they have the melody and octaves. Mm -hmm. And uh, in terms of making this sound aggressive with the horns, the trick to that has to do with the intervals you create in the voicing depends on depending on what tension you you use so that very first chord in the second measure with the d on top d b flat a f c the minor so, second yeah minor second in the voicing it's a g minor yeah g minor 11 chord if i take that a natural that ninth and move it to g you have that sound so that one little switch of the ninth instead of the root on that particular voicing gives it quite a bit of aggression because, because of the minus yeah. seven. So a lot of what you're going to see here is you manipulate the intervals in the voicing depending on the kind of sound you want to get. And pointing out specifically to get a more aggressive sound, it's minor seconds that give you the tension and it's major sevens. So those two intervals are, are incorporated quite a bit. And then in the second voicing, you'll see there's another minor second, and the voicing is uh, a form of a cluster. It's a very close combination of notes in the middle of the voicing. 
And the voicing spread out a little bit. It's, it's what's called a drop two voicing because mm -hmm. from that F on top, the next note you would normally write in close position would be a D, but I put the D down the octave. So it spreads the voicing out, and it's a combination of a cluster in the middle and a drop two voicing. And then just an add two voicing. And it's more again of that sound with the falling. Let me play this page. Come it up. Okay, continue the phrase and the highlight of that phrase. I do uh, some close position voicings, four notes. Uh, I'm doing some doublings. It says A2, meaning there's two people playing that line. So I have uh, the alto and the trumpet both playing the melody here. So I'm only using four notes, but I'm using five horns. And then when it goes to this higher note in the trumpets, then I spread it out and give the alto its, its own note. So you have... It's also very linear. So things are moving nice lines. Mm -hmm. Everyone has a line. They're not all exactly the same. Some people are moving in thirds. Some people are moving in seconds. But it, and it's all within the harmony, harmony of the B flat major. I like that the, the lower horns are moving down while the trumpet is going up. Right. Yeah, that yeah. contra motion is very recognizable. It makes the line stand out more. And then the last, that, the last voicing on the E7, sharp 9, flat 13. Uh, so we have the flat 13 on top, sharp 9, the 7th, the 3rd, and the root. And there's a major 7 interval between the G sharp, the 3rd, and the sharp 9. So that's where you get the most tension, and it gives us a little more advanced sound. If I used the root of the chord there, it would have been kind of bland. I could have used the flat 9. That would be a pretty good sound. But the sharp nine works nicely with the flat 13. And then I invert the chord. You'll notice that the root of the chord is not always at the bottom of the voicing. So in this next mm -hmm. voicing, the second measure halfway through, the bottom of the voicing is the tritone of the chord. And again, it's aggressive because of the intervals. Uh, and also... There's a little bit of side slip right there, so instead of using the same chord, instead of doing that, I used uh, what's called a dominant approach. Mm -hmm. And so, so there's a B7 chord for just one sixteenth note. And the interesting thing about using a dominant uh, in incidental harmony with dominant chords is the tritones move chromatically. Right. So. So it makes for a nice gesture. And then I move on. It's lower now. It's a little bit more mellow. I'm not, I don't have um, minor seconds or major sevens in, in every voicing. So it's not as aggressive sounding, mm -hmm. which was what I planned. And also the dynamics come down a little bit. So the phrasing is affected and the sound is affected by how I manipulate the intervals inside the voicings, depending on what notes I choose to substitute or not substitute in the chord. So I'm going to back it up a little bit so we can play this. So, uh, some two-part writing. Tenth. Tenth. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, some two part counterpoint. There's some uh, some movement in the in the lower voices is different than the top. Nice. And then back to aggressive. So that voicing has a minor second at the bottom, an A and then mm -hmm. a B flat. And then kind of a, a pyramid effect with these triplets. Get some contrary motion. It, it creates some interesting effects. And um, even some aggressive sounds in there that are more even aggressive than you realize it unless you slow it way down. The, on that measure, measure three in the, on this page, the fourth beat, if I play that chord alone, it doesn't sound so good because there's a flat nine between the bottom note and the top note, the B to the C. But when we hear it in context, we don't hear it as individual voicing, we hear it as individual lines. Mm -hmm. So that makes sense. Yeah. The, and the top, that makes sense. So you put them together, we don't really notice that for a second it's really dissonant maybe not so pleasing sounding, but the effect of it as a line works very well. Yeah. And then the last voicing here is an example of a fourth voicing, which gives you a different sound as opposed to stacked third voicings. Very okay. nice. Thanks. I'm going to back it up and just play some of this again. Take a look at that page a little bit. So, and I incorporate another voicing type, which is called spread voicings. Spread voicing is the name of a voicing that has low roots in it. And it's a typical voicing that a pianist might play if he's playing a ballad. That, that kind of idea on the voicing. Only this is spread out with the horns. So you see the low baritone and then the trombone, the tenor, and then the altos in the middle. change in motion from the 13 to the flat 13. So that gives a kind of a mellow sound and there's a guitar solo that is, is just starting up there. So it's a combination of a melodic line with the guitar um, and then so the melody that's going down and arpeggiated starts off as a real close melody with a minor second in the bottom again. back to a spread voicing. Mm -hmm. You'll also notice that I go back and forth between voicing and unison and octaves. So it's not necessary to voice every note. In fact, it would be boring. You can create what's called orchestrated accents by how you change the, um, the, the texture. So I change the texture in on that last part of the phrase. It's going to make this stand out because now five horns are playing the same pitches, as opposed to five horns playing five different pitches. So it's going to tend to make it stand out. So it's a way to make this, in a way, crescendo to the next high point. Yeah, like, very know, nice tip. Right. Very nice tip. It creates a good contrast. Right. And then I get to another version of a fourth voicing. Moving on, let me back this up and play it, and I'll stop again.
Okay, more of the same from the fourth voicing. A little bit of independence with the alto and trumpet playing that line. You can't read it. And I want to make a larger statement in that last ba da da ba da da da. So again, it's octaves. And a little bit more aggressive again, you see major seven intervals. In fact, this one has two. If you, uh, if you, if you look, this is the last voicing where that arrow is, last voicing in the second measure. Uh, starting from the bottom, F sharp, and an octave above that is an F natural. And then the A natural on the bottom, and then the A flat above that. So there's two major seven. Cool. And why are the two major sevens? Because I use the sharp nine on top and the flat nine on the bottom. So the sharp nine in the third chord is a major seven, and the root and the flat nine chord is a major seven. So you get two major sevens out of it. What's the bottom line? It's more aggressive. So, so it's an accent. Boot. Right. Yeah, nice, nice. Yeah, so it, it works well. And then the last... Of course, um, the register, where you're writing on the instruments, how high, how low, mid, that affects uh, the aggressive nature and the tone quality of it. When they play louder and they play higher, it sounds more aggressive no matter what you do voicing-wise. So it's, if you use aggressive voicings and you're writing it higher and louder, it's going to just add to the texture. And mm -hmm. this line was coming down, and then it's going to immediately go in that high note. So just the fact that you're writing a high C for the trumpet means it's going to be more aggressive. And then I've spread the voicing off from there. Okay. Okay, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. So I just did a little funny piano thing in there for, for laughs. Um, okay, so now it moves on with some more fourth voicings, some more linear writing. So you see real open sounding because there's fourth intervals. It's not just third intervals, but fourth intervals. So it makes it sound open and, and then... Again, there's a second at the bottom, and then I'm just moving parallel in the chord. No, oh, sorry. Against the rhythm section, and it, again, it's getting higher, so that's going to add to the sound of it. Mm -hmm. More the same, I got the baritone down to the bottom now, to the low root, so I'm really spreading this chord out quite a bit. Uh, a chord? Oh, sorry, let's see. I'm actually spreading that out a little further than you normally would, but I had to, to incorporate all those notes. And the rhythm normally, section, normally we would spread a tenth. More yeah, or less, right? tenth, tenth on the bottom, and normally inside the voicing would be no more than a sixth. So I'm good here, but then... And I'm good at the top, but there's a distance between the G sharp and the G natural of a major seven. So that's a little wide. Right. The rhythm yeah. section is going to fill it in because the rhythm section is playing notes in that chord too. Mm -hmm. And then I did that same thing. The next chord is an interesting sound. Like I said before, you don't always have to have the root on the bottom. So this produces a kind of a mellow sound with the fifth in the bottom. And it's the sound of an A minor triad and a G major triad. 
because I only had uh, five horns, I wanted to get all of the G triad, and I needed part of the A minor triad, so I chose those two notes. Mm -hmm. And you have the bass playing the root there? So. Yeah, and the bass is playing the root, so it, you're going to hear it anyway. Yeah. Um, and you get an interesting sound because you do get the C to D. So you get that second in the voicing. And it's kind of mellow because they're playing pretty soft, and they do a little crescendo and decrescendo in there. Okay. It's just a unison background line. No. And then back to alto tenor and combo. Here's why I changed the style. As high strings as you can do. Okay, a couple of things to point out here. Uh, first of all, change of style, kind of a weather report to feel happening, like a Jocko mm -hmm. bass thing. Uh, when the horn's playing here, I'm also, again, going for some aggressive sounds, and I use upper structure triads. Upper structure triads are major triads that fit as part of uh, a particular chord symbol. So in, in this case, starting on that third beat, there's an E-flat triad over C7, and then there's a D triad over C7. So it, it, gives, it has a particular sound because we recognize the structure of triads and then we recognize how it fits into the whole chord. Just four notes, but that major seven, 13 on top, flat seven below, gives us a major seven. So you'll see a lot of examples with 13s on dominant chords because of that rub. Uh, also, a lot of examples of 13 flat 9 because then you get two rubs. So I get the idea on that. Back up a little bit. Okay, I want to point out right here that five note spread voicing it sounds really nice and even in the lower register with the five horns. Yeah. I gotta look close at it. Okay, so so it's a thirteen a C thirteen voicing. And then I like the eight. major second in the middle. Yep. And then again you have So this one has the flat nine, the B flat, that rubs with the low A, and then G, F sharp, major seven. So that combination. So those of you in the audience that play piano, this is exactly a piano voicing. There's, a, there's no difference between this and, and somebody comping on the piano. So does it help to play piano if you're going to be in a major? Yes, it does. <laughs> or in, in, uh, in Douglas's case, guitar. Right? Yeah, I'm studying piano now also. <laughs> yeah, you can't get enough piano. There's no such thing as too much piano. Yeah. Um, so, again, it's the it's what 
tensions you select to use that'll give you those aggressive sounds. Okay, let me just see what happens in the next thing. Uh, more of the same. I'll just play it back from here again. Ultimate, uh, ultimate, so I can find that. I'm trying to play that last bit. I'm trying to skip ahead is not, doesn't want to do it for me. Let me try. That's good. Good. Yeah, so just to show you that last part, so. I got that right? Uh, A flat. So, interesting chord, that's a G7 sus flat 9. So it's a did the, sus did chord. The trump, did the trumpet uh, really play that uh, F natural there, the E, E flat? At the end? Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, the volume might be a little low for me here. Or right, right, and and uh, the le next to the last lick, you see, it's in three octaves. And then now again, that's really wide, but hopefully it'll it'll, it'll coalesce all together. And then very aggressive at the end because I have B flat to A, E to E flat. And then I don't have the A flat, but in the C. So a couple of major sevens in there to give it a lot of spice, and it's high. <clears throat> so it's a combination. <coughs> so if we have any questions, other questions, I'd be glad to answer yeah. on this. Let's see here. <coughs> uh, any question, guys? Would you like to ask any questions about this? Uh, let's see. There's a question here, Gary. Mm -hmm. I like the way he used unison or open chords at at, at the right moments. Right. right. Yeah. Uh, you, you have to follow the phrasing of the chord of the line to kind of figure that out. Often you change positions when there's either a rest or a leap, so that it makes sense to do it. If I have a unison line, so I, I it's when it leaps that I go into the voicing. So it, it's definitely uh, planned out where I make those changes. And I know that any time I go to unison octaves, it's going to be aggressive sounding, just the fact that so many people are playing the same notes. Right. And it's a good texture. It's not a cop-out to go to unison. It sounds great. You listen to the, the groups like Blood, Sweat, and Tears in Chicago and, and I'm sure some of the uh, Brazilian bands as well, and there's a lot of unison, a lot of unison yeah. octaves. And it sounds great. And... But if you voice everything or you go, go unison everything, it gets boring. So you go back and forth between the two. Right. And you also, you do a texture with just two notes. In fact, I think that's Brazilian too. Yeah. Where, where it's just two notes or in sixes. Yeah. You know, something I like to do with two notes to, to voice, Gary, sometimes, not to, to harmonize all the time, like thirds and fourth and fifths. I like to keep one. Uh, in only one note, like a pedal note, and move the other one. Right. That sounds nice too. Like like the Beatles song. Last night I said these words to my girl, and then the the other voice goes. Last night I said these words to my girl. Yeah. It, I, right. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then you, can, you have one pedal note and the other one. Right. 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 Yeah, and yeah. It, it's really dissonant for a second, but we hear it as lines. So, right, yeah, and absolutely. it's different. It's a, another yeah. way to use two horns mm -hmm. uh, and to create a different texture. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There, there's another uh, question here, Gary. Make 
Make the horn section not much contrapuntal is important. What do uh, I'm not sure what who, yeah, really, I, yeah, I think what he what he's saying is 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 it better for them to always play the same rhythms? And it's just a decision you make. There was a little bit of counterpoint in this. There's a few places where I div divided the horn section into two, two or three people on one line and two people on another line, and I did vary the lines a little bit. Uh, it just depends on what you're trying to do. It's a definite texture. Mm -hmm. uh, in this particular tune, I was going for pretty aggressive most of the time, uh, but absolutely. So definitely having them play different rhythms at the same time creates uh, another kind of texture. Nice. Gary, there is a comment here. It's in Portuguese, but I'm going to translate for you. Okay. Uh, I, want to, I want to thank him very much. His book is incredible. It's amazing and helped me a lot to write arrangements. Great. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, we should mention, I, I've told this to... Uh, to Douglas, I've seen that my book is available on Amazon. Do not buy it from Amazon. Somebody put a price of $100 on Amazon. No reason to do that. You buy the book from my website, lindsayjazz.com, and it's, it's $39.95 plus shipping. Shipping to Brazil is pretty expensive. I think it's maybe another $20, but it's still way under the $100 that someone is trying to sell my book on Amazon. So buy it directly from the source, me. This is an amazing book. Uh, Gary, you developed this book through many years, right? Uh, yes. Teaching yeah. and... Yeah, I, I actually, the, the, the truth is, I taught arranging with just a little workbook that I created. So for mm -hmm. the first 25 years of teaching, I was using a 35-page pamphlet that I would just copy and give out to the students. Mm -hmm. And um, with encouragement from my wife, who said, you better write the book before your students do, I wrote this <laughs> book... And, and I incorporated much of what I say in the lectures and lots of examples um, and covered a lot of material. So I, so I taught for 25 years learning what works and what doesn't work in the teaching process and then wrote the book. And it's been very successful. I sell it all over the world. There's probably 40 schools around the world that use this book. And yeah. then I sell it across to individuals all over too. So, There's another question here, Gary. Do you give any instructions to the improviser? Uh, no. In this particular case, uh, Andrew Sinewick, who played guitar, he would listen to the track and know exactly what the style is. So I didn't need to say anything to him. If I had a younger player that wasn't as experienced, I might tell them to listen to a particular artist to get into the style of it, because there's a particular style of solo that, that works well with this. But in the case of Andrew, he can play any style. He's so wide-ranging in his abilities to, to play funk and jazz and classical and everything. Brazilian he music. He plays Brazilian music very well. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. I, I stayed in his house in L.A. for a few years, and we were playing uh -huh. guitar together. He, will, oh. he would play, like, Wave and Don Jobim songs really well. He, he's an amazing guitarist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's but another? Was, yeah, sorry. I was no, just going to say, here. if I was working with a... Uh, someone that wasn't sure what style to play, and I would try to give them some uh, some, some help. Yeah. Some instructions. Yeah. yeah. There's another uh, question here. Uh, it's in Portuguese. I'm going to translate. There was uh, this type of writing when he thinks of separate melodies, like counterpoint melodies. Does he cons uh, consider the traditional rules of counterpoint, like uh, classical counterpoint, baroque counterpoint, or something? Well, I studied species counterpoint. That's what they call it here. I studied that for about three or four months um, when I was an undergraduate, so many, many years ago. Uh, and it helped. But I also studied line writing, which is a technique that they teach at Berkeley uh, that just makes you more aware of how one line against another is affected. And so my counterpoint is improvised counterpoint, I would say. I created by improvising, uh, understanding how the linear lines, how they work, and trying to find something to complement it. So there's a lot of experimentation, and it's, much of it is, is improvised. But I understand what counterpoint is about, and I understand the, the aspect of it. So I kind of incorporate both my ideas and the traditional. 
Cool. Gary, you want to show something else? Sure. Sure. Okay. So the, the next thing I'm going to show you, uh, it's going to be, it's a big band with uh, vocalists and probably going to be a little hard to see because it's many Wait, more notes. The other one, right? Yeah. Um, i got to change it over. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to start it again, but let me just explain what we're looking at here. Mm -hmm. I created a condensed score of the full big band. So these first two lines are all the saxophones, and woodwinds. Sometimes they're playing sax, sometimes they're playing woodwinds. And then all the brass are right here. So basically the trumpet's on one line and the trombone's on the next. Um, then the voice, and then you can see guitar, piano, bass, and drums. Um, and there's lots of annotations in there that I'm sure you can't read. They're too small. But uh, the idea that I had in this, first of all, was to feature Julia Dollison, who was a great vocalist from Colorado. And I didn't want to write just the band playing accompaniment to vocal. I wanted to do more like a dialogue. So you'll see that the band interjects um, a dialogue with the vocal back and forth. So it's, it's much more than just an accompaniment. It's really uh, a piece written so that it features the vocal and it features the big band. Nice. So let me start it one more time. And we'll play a portion of it. Point out a few things from the mm -hmm. beginning. So um, the first tune, Spring is Here. I'm trying to get the idea of spring, so that's why you hear flutes, and that's why you hear trills, and you hear a little bit of uh, xylophone, things that, that bring that out. I started the brass and mutes to have plenty of room for the flutes and uh, clarinets to stick out. And uh, in the beginning, it's everything is rising. You'll see the bass line. Gary, this you just said is very, very important. I think maybe I'm just going to say it again. Uh, what Gary is saying is that he, he had the lyrics as an inspiration to have ideas for the arrangement. And this right. is always nice when you write, Gary, when you are going to write an arrangement to listen and understand the lyrics and see what the lyrics can tell you and suggest uh, ideas and stuff. Absolutely, yeah. And I mean, the first, as Douglas knows, a lot of times you don't write the introduction first. I wrote a lot of the main body of the piece because I would incorporate things that I used there into the introduction. So, but what is an introduction supposed to do? It's supposed to introduce you to the mood of the piece and something about the story. So everything's spring, basically that's what it's about. And in this particular case, I have everyone rising, so there's these diminished lines coming in and against the flutes that are going up. Every, basically, everyone's rising. Um, and then I start the dialogue in the next next page. Let me, let me play it from the top one more time. So you can hear the flutes are dancing. She says, why, why is my heart dancing? Mm -hmm. And the flutes are basically doing that. They're doing all, all these ornamental figures um, and the trombones are adding a little bit of punch here and there. The, even the piano was added with the flutes somewhat. So it's all, again, the lyric is very important to what's going on. You'll notice that what the vocal is singing is also happening in the lead trumpet, and it's happening in the, in the saxophone as well. So it's okay to double the vo vocalist, and the vocalist doesn't necessarily have to sing exactly these rhythms. So we mm -hmm. can hear... And I, I learned this from experience playing with other singers as a backup musician, that the band can be playing the melody and the singer can be singing it in, in her or his own way, and it works. In this case, she sang it pretty exact on there. But it works well. Uh, also, <laughs> for added interest, you'll see that there's these other quarter note lines that are happening against the half notes, just to keep it more moving. You know, and there's some contrary lines happening in the trombones. So it's a combination of, of things there. The, the uh, original piece does not go into 3-4. So when, you, when you're hearing the piece in 4-4, four, four, and then all of a sudden it's in 3-4, it adds a bit of energy and forward motion. It, it normally is ba-da-da, da, but not ba mm. gong 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 By taking one beat away and squ squishing the rhythms in, it gives you this added energy. And it's a nice little contrast for a second because immediately when I feature the band on the melody over here, can you see my pointer? No. You can't see it? Okay. Well, in, in, uh, measure, the only, th yeah. in measure 39, when it, uh, it goes back into 4-4 four, four and I feature the band, 
that's kind of an abrupt change that it goes back from 3-4 to 4-4. Four, four. So it makes for a kind of dramatic contrast. Very nice contrast. Yeah. I really like this 3-4. Th mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm going to stop it for a second because there's a couple of really aggressive chords I just want to show. Yeah. So many again, ideas, so many great ideas. Yeah, thank you. That, so again, this is a dialogue. So gone on on, and, and then the saxes are with the vo vocal, and then the brass against it. Um, let me just move it to the next page. Uh, okay. Yeah, right here. So the third measure that we're looking at, uh, measure 175 and 176, it's an example of what we, what we talked about with the other other horns in the other example, but many more horns. Mm -hmm. I got to look close at it to see what it is. So if you look at the chord symbol in the analysis of it, you see it's an E flat triad, an E triad, and a C on the bottom. So it's, I don't know, I don't know exactly what it is, but it's, I like it. <laughs> it's a polychord, nice polychord. Yeah, it's polychord, but it's, polychord. it's a polychord with a different root. So okay. E flat, E natural, and then the C, and then I just run that parallel. Yeah, it's all it's all basically the same. Oh, that, right those now. notes are all in the Dom Jean scale, Dom 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 dominant diminished scale. Dominant isn't diminished. It? Maybe I'm not Maybe. sure. Yeah, yeah, I need to check, but it yeah. sounds like. Yeah, but it. It's kind of a Stravinsky-ish thing. Right. So at the relationship, you got the E triad and then and then the E flat triad. It's really important that you put the E on the bottom and the E flat above it. Because the other way, it sounds like this. Yeah. It sounds not so good. Yeah. But this one with the intervals it works pretty well. So this goes from being mellow to being really, really aggressive. Okay. I just continue it from here. So that's that's the setup for the for the next tune. Talk a little bit about the. I know we're running out of time, but I just want uh, this to talk to this you. part around measure two ten. There's a yeah. very nice idea there. You took the bass, all the low part mm -hmm. off, right? You have the yeah. floating idea like the, with the, the singers and the high instruments. Yeah, the, the starting in uh, two o six, I think it is. Yeah, starting two o six. There's no bass, and if you look at the piano. So it's kind of these cluster, and I took, that's the last part of the melody. Mm -hmm. And then I started overlapping, you know? So you go to the next page, and all of this was to transition into a completely different tune. Up, up jump spring. So it's another spring tune, but it's a completely different tune. And mm -hmm. I didn't write this transition until after I worked on Up Jump Spring. So I needed to figure out, this This was a head scratcher. How do I get from one tune to the other and make sense out of it? So I kind of used the end of the first tune to find a way to transition. So when it gets here, if you look at the brass, you can see that it's... So they're, they're offset by a beat. And then the trombones have a kind of contrasting line to that. And the saxes are playing similar to what the, the piano had. Something like that. So, um, yeah, I really like this part. I think this yeah. worked pretty well, the way it transitioned. So let me back it up one more time and just play a little bit of that transition so you can see how that flows into the next tune. Wow, very nice, Gary. There are so yeah. many, there are so many details, so many ideas that it, we could spend like hours talking about this mm -hmm. chart, this arrangement, and and wow, very nice. So you like the um, the band contrast? I did a little uh, metric modulation, yeah, to to slow it down, and give it a heavy swing for a little bit, and then transition pretty smoothly into back to the fast three again. Because a refreshing, yeah, refreshing makes, feeling. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. you know when you do things, when things are going by really fast, you don't always get to appreciate what you're trying to do harmonically. 
but yeah. by, by using the metric modulation. It's going much slower. You can hear what, what I'm trying to do there. Nice. Gary, you. unfortunately, uh, we don't have a lot of time, but it would be nice to go through all the details okay. of this arrangement. Uh, amazing arrangement. I really like the idea of uh, conversation, uh, question and answer between the, the band and the singer. Very, very nice. Gives movement to the music yeah. because sometimes we listen to a lot of arrangements that are, you know, the rhythm session keeps the beat, but then there's some long notes in the background just feeling the chords. It, it, right. it, it's, it, kind of, it gets tiring, right? It does, right. It, it does. Yeah. So it's, it's good to have movement. Mm -hmm. Nice, very right. nice. And many, many ideas. Very rich arrangement. arrangement. Thank you. We have some more. Uh, let's say here. Well, uh, I'm going to translate, Gary. Marcio. Yeah. Marcio is a student of mine. He's a great piano player. Uh, uh, he is writing an arrangement and his, uh, he, he wants to thank you for your book, too. And he says that he learns a lot from your book. Um, what else? What kind of question and answer is awesome, typical and brilliant, nice. Uh, nice background scenes, like using melody at the background. Yeah, some, did, sometimes right? I do. Yeah, sometimes there's a little bit of the melody, especially if you can elongate the melody and have it go by a little slower, because uh, you're trying not to get in the way too much of the soloist, but you want to keep the interest and you want to kind of push the soloist to to build so you build in the backgrounds too but sure definitely use part of the melody or even just the rhythm of the melody different things to to bring them together so it doesn't sound like everything's a new idea but they're related nice and uh do you like harry james he he's one of the first uh bands i heard live when i was probably a teenager i went to a concert of harry james so sure very exciting Cool. Uh, come visit us and bring your wonderful music. That, that would, would be nice. Be, that'd be fun. I've, I've been to Brazil uh, two times, I think. Yeah. Uh, maybe just one time. One time. Uh, but yeah, I would love to come back. Cool. Love, in case you all don't realize this, I love Brazilian music. Absolutely love it. It's Gary, really actually, guys, Gary is, start, is practicing some Shoto music, right, Gary? Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm practicing clarinet, getting my clarinet chops back together. And I'm sure it was one way to do it because you it's hard. <laughs> but yeah. It's fun. A lot of fun. And Gary knows a lot of Brazilian music like Baião, Samba, Maracatu, mm -hmm. Choro, everything. Yeah, I, know, uh, I love. Another uh, question here. Where they can listen to your music, Gary? They're, they want to listen uh, to more. This, this, if you go online, um, there's a couple of things. First of all, I'm. I'm not sure how much of my album is available, but that's, that you can probably find that online at Spotify. There's a, um, the album is, let me get it so you can see it. No, well, Ajanor is saying that Shoto is our Brazilian bebop. You can see that? Yeah. yeah. Nice. Nice. South Florida Jazz Orchestra, music of Gary Lindsay. Cool. Very nice, Gary. Yeah. Is it on That's Spotify true. also? It, it might be. Uh, the other thing I know, I know on... Uh, you can find also, because the other group that I wrote for a lot is the Miami Saxophone Quartet. And I had a lot of writing for them um, and a lot of different kinds of things. It's a saxophone quartet, but it's a jazz quartet, not a classical quartet. Mm -hmm. But and that I know is online, too. I mean, iTunes has all of We have five CDs out with the Miami Saxophone Quartet. This is on iTunes. Uh, I'm not, it's probably on Spotify, but I don't know for sure. Cause I don't well, know. Uh, uh, Genoa is saying that it is it on is. Spotify. Good. Yeah, so you can check it out. And that tune we just played is one of the tunes on the... Recording. 
And for yeah. saxophone players, would be nice to listen to the saxophone quartet tunes. Yeah, Miami saxophone quartet. Yeah, a yeah. lot, lot of different kind of writing for that. Um, if you want to have me back sometime, Douglas, we could talk about just that, just the Miami right. saxophone quartet. Like, which would be like more like a linear writing and counterpointer counter yeah, point yeah, writing, and, right? And, and in that particular group, it started off as an a cappella group. Um, I don't know if that's a universal word or not, a cappella, but. What's the, what's the Brazilian for acapella? Do you know? Acapella. It's, it's, same, it's the same, same word. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's easy. Yeah. I can speak yeah. Brazil. Yeah. <laughs> At this one speak. word. <laughs> yes. Um, so it started off that way, but then we did things with rhythm section as well. And right. the, the, it's a very much a challenge to write for just four saxophones, nothing else. Mm -hmm. You have to provide the rhythm and the harmony and the bass and all that within four players. Did you, did you bring some ideas from the string quartet? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And then I don't know if you ever heard this, but I wrote a piece for string quartet and saxophone quartet. Oh, wow. Nice. The, no, I never the, heard. The, there was a combination and it's some of it's kind of classical sounding, but also very jazzy. And I wrote pieces to feature piano, to feature woodwinds, to feature uh, vibes. And so all many different, many different kinds of combinations with the saxophone quartet. Well, Marcy is saying here that he, he listened to your, uh, quartets with Gary Keller. Right, that's the one. Right. That's the group. Yep. Gary, uh, I'll say one more time about the book, guys. If you want to buy the book, go to Gary's website, which is lindsayjazz.com. And because I don't know who are selling on Amazon for, you know, $100, but it's much cheaper if you buy from Gary. Um, this is the book. It's an amazing book that he developed through many years teaching and with experience teaching uh, arranging. So definitely, uh, if you want to study arrangement, take it seriously, serious, it should buy this book. And uh, Gary, I want to thank you for the amazing job that you did at University of Miami. Like I have two colleagues here from Brazil who studied there also, Rodrigo Morte and yeah. Rafael Picoloto de Lima, right? I think uh -huh. we, were, we were the three Brazilians who studied there, I think. And yeah. you did an amazing job for many years. You just retired now and joined the beach. Yeah. And joined the beach, but also doing writing. You know, I'm I'm still writing. I'm right. about to I'm about to do some some clinics uh, at the University of North Florida coming up, and so it's fun because I every day I can spend time writing for myself, my own things, right. and uh, developing different ideas. So that's the great thing about writing. It doesn't. There's no age limit on writing. Right. You can keep writing. So. Right. Music right. in general, yes. right? Yeah. And so, congr <laughs> so congratulations for your amazing job you did there at the University of Miami. Thank you very much for everything you taught me. And thank you very much for accepting, kindly accepting my invitation to be here, talk to my audience about arranging. It's a real pleasure. Thank you. I okay, it. Gary. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for participating. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.